it's, it's funny, I've, I've never met a roaster anywhere in the world who don't think they pay really well for coffee. Sure. Uh, everybody thinks, no, we yeah. pay really well for coffee, but we need a discussion about, well, what is paying really well for coffee? Because right now it's totally abstract. Welcome to or welcome back to Coffee with April. My name is Patrick Rolf, and this is a conversation with some amazing professionals and entrepreneurs in the coffee industry. Sharing their perspective and experience, it's about integrity, quality, and the future. For this conversation, we met up with Klaus Thompson, co-founder of The Coffee Collective. We talked about roasting, we talked about direct trade, a term that they were a big part of starting. We also talked about coffee shops and how it is to grow a business and keep your staff happy. A truly inspiring conversation at his roastery here in Copenhagen. So we're sitting in the uh, Coffee Collective uh, roastery, a uh, beautiful space. It's actually the first time I'm behind the scenes here. I've never been before, so that's really fun. Uh, I'm sitting with uh, Klaus Thompson, uh, and this is going to be a really, really interesting conversation. Uh, I bet most of you have already heard about Coffee Collective um, to, to some extent. And we're going to start with something they're doing right here in Copenhagen right now, which is basically opening up another coffee shop. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so this, uh, this new place is actually officially opening today. We yeah. did open one week ago. It's a, it's a new uh, street food kitchen, uh, street kitchen food market, whatever you want to call it. Um, which sits uh, in an interesting location down at the harbor. Um, this, uh, I think it's uh, two years ago, they opened a new bridge connecting Newhound to the other side, Christianstown, yeah. where Noma used to be. And now uh, the building hosts restaurant bar and Noma's sister restaurant 108, just in the corner. And between there, there's a square just where that bridge comes over. And um, Noma, or the people behind Noma, decided to go together with a company called uh, Copenhagen Street Food, who had okay. a very successful street food market on uh, a neighboring island that basically yeah. called Papirium, yeah. uh, which closed down at New Year's. And they got the lease for this square for the next three years and decided to do a, a street food market. But said they wanted to sort of raise the bar on the quality of the street food markets of instead course, of having yeah. every every happy amateur out there they said well let's approach some of the people who are a little more experienced and who provide something a little more interesting maybe yeah um, sure. and have them open up um, not to say there's not a great room for the other thing um, for someone to try out something but they wanted this to sort of be more quality focused um, and so Noma of course got the task of saying well you go around and ask for the food and then people from appearing would do the drinks and that's how they divided it and for some reason, the, some lucky reason for us, the, <laughs> the part of the food groups thought that, well, these guys are thinking about, or the other guys are thinking about beer and wine yeah. and cocktails, but what about coffee? And sure. they said they couldn't do this food market without having some coffee, so they approached us. When, when talking about Coffee Collective, it's, it's hard not to talk about coffee shops. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I think a lot about when I travel around the world and I go to coffee shops is, my God, they're all the same. They're all the same. And it gets so frustrating out in the world when you travel. You know, go to Shanghai and you experience the same kind of coffee shop as you would do in, for example, in, in, in Copenhagen or in New York. But then when I look at what you guys are doing, and you guys have four coffee shops today, right? Well, now, now five with this well, one. Well, now five with yeah, you, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're completely different. They're yeah. completely different. They're individual and they have a very high amount of integrity, right? Meaning mm -hmm. that you can spend the full day going to five different locations they all have really good coffee, uh, but it's completely different experiences. Yeah. Is that something that has been very important? Something that you guys have been thinking about or something that just randomly just... Oh, happened? yeah. No, it's very uh, it's it's very much so the, the core of the DNA uh, with sure. us when it comes to the coffee shop. Yeah. Um, and so I'm glad you, you mentioned this and, and you, you have that experience sure, because... Yeah. For us, that's that's really the. It's one of the big drivers for us. One of the yeah. key things that motivates us is to not ne never have thought about this as a chain. Mm. I mean, we. I think originally we had. 
I think we always had plans that this would grow in some capacity or another. Yeah. But we never sat down and said, okay, we want five coffee shops. We said, well, let's take one at a time and see what de- develops. Sure. Um, and with each of them, it's been from this growing wish that we've seen, well, there's room for doing something new. There's room for t- trying out something different, uh, a different kind of environment and... With that environment, what kind of service do we want to provide? What kind of atmosphere or what kind of mood um, do you want to be in when you enter this shop? Um, and it goes through everything from the the kind of service that you do, uh, yeah. the way you approach customers and the way you actually serve the coffee down mm-hmm. to what you present on the menu. Yeah. And of course, the interior and sort of the, the whole vibe of the place. So it's it's I think it's one of the things that for us is super interesting and it it's a it's a fun challenge as well thinking well how how do you keep something that still feels coherent yeah throughout the entire company and still do something that's so different in each shop that you can have that feeling that yeah. you're basically visiting four or five completely different coffee shops yeah um and it, it's fun it's it's a challenge but i think that the way we overcome it is that every time we've opened something we've we've sat down with a clean sheet of paper basically yeah. and just thought well throw everything away there's nothing given like we can start just throwing out ideas and yeah. you can do sort of a it's almost like a brainstorm or a session where you, you just throw out ideas and you you feel like what's out there what what do we think is fun right now or yeah. what would interest in us or what yeah. do we think this area of the city needs or what do you think where's coffee heading right now or so on sure. um, yeah. and then Funnily enough, I think because we're you know we're all here for working full time, we 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 sort of always have sort of similar ideas or at least similar directions, and yeah. then there's a lot of different smaller ideas that you connect into a concept. Sure. Um, and then that slowly develops, um, and it can be the history of the location, or it can be what area we are in, or just where we are as people mm. right mm. at that moment. Yeah. That translates into what does the sort of the concept of that shop become yeah sure and it's for me it's much more fun than saying like let's do like one ultimate coffee shop concept and yeah. then let's do 10 of those yeah because i don't think that that exists uh, like the ultimate coffee concept i think mm-hmm. it's like what's the best restaurant it's like imagine if all restaurants were the same it's like an absurd thought Absolutely. like it's, it's interesting sure. to go out because you can go to different places yeah i do have my favorite places that i tend to visit sure. very very often um, and I tend to go back to and have been doing so for many years but yeah. at the same time I like to go out and experience new things and then I find some favorites and I frequent them more often but is, yeah. is that a is that a scary process I, I had a very similar discussion with uh, James Hoffman <coughs> earlier as well and we were talking about the the importance of reinventing uh, yourself as a person but also as a yeah. company which means that you know something that works today may not work in the future right? yeah so you need to find a better version of it and yeah. and when you then open up these coffee shops that are so different from each other do you ever like stop and feel okay wow this may not work this is a bit scary or is that just no we have to do this this is the only way to do it we want to do it and you know we want to do a new thing i think you have to to have some faith in your ideas and then follow through with them yeah. and, and believe that they can work and give them some time. Um, and most often I find if it, if it's a good idea and you believe in it, then it will work. It, it, the, was, this, it, but then, was it always like that? Like, has it been like that for you since you were growing up a little kid or is this something that comes, it's a confidence that comes from seeing Coffee Collective grow as a company into something very successful or? I, I think for both Casper and, and Peter and I, it's very much from that experience we had as baristas early on in yeah. working in uh, back in the days at Estate Coffee and in other coffee shops before sure. that, that we saw and, and learned that, that, you know, there was an appreciation of the things we were doing. Yeah. And and I remember, like, we, we talked about this often, that there was quite often there was someone would say, like, oh, yeah, this coffee thing is just a trend. Yeah. Like, shooting now is like, oh, yeah, it's a... You know, and this is like what 10, 15 years ago, and people were calling it a trend. That's something that you know, it peaks and then it dies down again. That's yeah. a trend. Yeah. And we were like, I don't, we don't really think so. We think this, we are onto something here. We yeah, think it's sure. more than a trend. We think it's a development. It's yeah. something that steadily will grow. Yeah. Um, and and it happened with a lot of things. Like people were, you know, 
saying the same thing with like, yeah, but you know, can people really taste the quality difference? Like people were like, no, nah, they can't. Like most like nine out of 10 consumers can't taste the difference. Yeah. And we're like, that's completely bullshit. Like yeah. our experience working behind the bar was that no, pretty much everyone who comes in can actually taste the difference. Sure. They can really appreciate it. They're not dumb. They can taste like maybe they never thought about it before, but even subconsciously, they feel the difference. Yeah. So we, we have this, I think that's, it didn't come from my childhood. I think it very much came from those experience that no, like we are onto something and it works and there's a market for it. Mm. I don't know how often we've heard that thing like, oh yeah, it's such a niche market. I was like, well, it's a pretty big niche then. It's a pretty I big mean, niche. it's, uh, I, I have a report uh, the other day saying that three out of four people in Denmark self-identify as foodies, people yeah. who are interested yeah, in yeah, food sure. in some capacity or another. Yeah. That's a pretty fucking big niche. <laughs> that's yeah. like, that's, that's room to grow. Sure. Um, and these are the kind of people that we speak to. They are not like necessarily hardcore go- coffee geeks. Yeah. They're just people who appreciate whatever they consume and yeah. they like to be picky about it and they like to taste things. Uh, they like to learn more about it. Uh, maybe they don't want to know everything about it, yeah. but they like to know something. And there's, for those who want to know everything about it, there should be room for them to dive further into it. And I think that's what, what we provide um, so I think it, it very much comes from that. But at the same time, I have to admit, it is it can be super scary. Yeah. It can be where you go to the point you you do something and you think, fuck, it's yeah. like, wow, is that really work? But then I think we also, we've gotten quite good at sort of reevaluating the things that we're doing. Sure. And then also not being too stubborn or proud to say, no, we, like, we can't change it. Like yeah, there's yeah, a ton of, of things that we've changed um, over the years. And you mm-hmm. just learn like, okay, that was a really good idea, but it doesn't work in practical. Like, it's just, we, we just don't, we're like, we can't do that thing. Like, and yeah. it can be something like, uh, I'm thinking of an example. Like, um, I mean, it actually works pretty well now, but we we had all these ideas about how we wanted to do table service yeah. here at Gotham's Five, for example, sure. in the bar. And, and we talked a lot about like personal service. And I think a lot of those talked really good about how you do service in a different environment. If it was a wine bar yeah. or restaurant, how do you actually do service there? Because it's ultimately very different than what you see in a typical coffee shop. Definitely. And so we wanted this place to be more about that, more about that sort of restaurant feel and vibe. And, you know, gotten a lot of inspiration from some of the best wine bars and some of the best restaurants and seeing, you know, really good um, waiters who are both really professional but also have a a personal approach to how they yeah. do it. They meet people at eye level. They feel them out and see where they are and they, you know, maybe they even like almost sit down next to you yeah. without being too much either. But And so we, we implemented a lot of those things here but at the same time then you realize, well, we're not a restaurant. We don't have a floor staff. Sure. You have a kitchen and a floor staff that yeah. are basically the same person. Yeah. And at times you're one person opening the shop. So you have to do everything. Then you have to go back and evaluate. Then, then how do you set yourself up so that it's also easy and it feels good for the barista? So you don't put too much of these conceptual ideas mm. into a working environment and then you can't really deliver it. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, like, I think, I mean, to be honest, I haven't been that big a part of that process. It's been very much the bar managers here, um, Peter Eprop and now Jakob, who's developed that. Yeah. And taking in those considerations set with a with the team of baristas as a group, with Rasmus as the general bar manager, and then develop these things over time. Yeah. And I think that continuous development where you have baristas and they come back and say, well, you know what, uh, I come from this other bar now, I've been working in Tohan, and what I realized coming out here is that I'm walking like five times the distance. Yeah. Just because if you look at from one end of the bar to the other end of the room, that's a long distance. Sure. So your feet are tired. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I'm like, honestly, I never thought about that. Like, I know it's so simple, but I've never thought about that. Yeah. So those kind of developments and, and how it transfers into, yeah, into the daily work, I find, yeah. I find that super fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. And it's something that, that I've seen over the years here, which is um, going back to what, one of the biggest challenges with a coffee shop is staffing. I would say to yeah. some extent. It's yeah. very hard for a lot of coffee shops around the world to retain staff, to keep them motivated. We all know that in coffee, you very, very quick kind of hit the ceiling, where it's mm. like, where am I supposed to go next? And yeah. At least from the outside, it looks like you guys have some kind of magic recipe and kind of figured that out. 
because what I see is staff that stayed for a very long time. Mm. I see staff that moves through various different positions within the company as well, which has been very challenging for me personally as well. Part, mm. part of why I'm having a coffee roastery now is because I hit those ceilings in all of these other companies. How are you guys uh, uh, approaching that? And, and even just listening to you now saying that, you know, okay, so a staff member said this and we actually listened to that person and we implemented it. How, you know, how has that kind of come about? Has that always been there? Is that always something important? And how did you manage to get to a point where you actually could do this, like take care of your staff properly? Yeah, I think it's it's very much due to the, through the four, four when we start, set up the company, yeah. you know, the all of us that founded the company, we, we like our entry into coffee was as baristas. Sure. So that, that was our first job in coffee. It's how we got interested in coffee. Yeah. That means that you have just a really good understanding about what does that mean? Like what is the, the job of that, but also the significance of the baristas. Yeah. That, you know, it's, it's such a cliche to say that, you know, your staff is the most important asset you have. Mm. And I hear, I don't think you'll find a company who, who doesn't somewhere say that, but, sure. but to actually genuinely believe it and, f- and thoroughly understand it yeah. is something different. To really have it like in your backbone, you know, I have the biggest appreciation when I go and do a few hours on bar and I f- remember how rusty I am yeah. as a barista and how many small details of the daily work there is to remember. Yeah, Just sure. this like... Sure. The other day, when, when we opened the, the new shop, I was in, on bar for a few hours, and Adam, who's our bar manager there, he just like got, gave me a small introduction to how he does the Fetco, which is like, I know how to put a Fetco on. It's mm. the simplest thing in a lot of ways. Yeah. But then you realize the amount of small details yeah. that all the staff know, yeah. like of, of just the sequencing of things, yeah. like that you don't waste a second with, while the the sample you're taking aside for your uh, extra mojo measurement is cooling down. You're using those seconds while that's cooling down to do five other things. Yeah. And there's a whole list for everything. Yeah. Like it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I can follow the list and I know it. I, I, like initially I helped develop that list, but then I, I feel like, fuck yeah, you just have to have that on your backbone. So you don't have to think about it and yeah. you're doing it and you're saving and it's seconds we're talking about it. and it's through everything. Yeah. And I, yeah. So I have, I have the biggest appreciation for, the staff that they take that kind of ownership yeah. on all those things and the way they teach each other, you know, to do those things even better. That's, that's, you know, that's really magical. Mm. And then I think I, you know, it's, it is something that the, uh, I remember when, when I uh, first started working together with Peter, that he's always been very, very um, conscious about the importance of, you know, that a, a decision where you get more people together about, mm you know, getting more people's input and feedback sure. will always be a better decision rather than one person just taking the lead all yeah. the time. Yeah. And I think that is, you know, it, you know, it, it is part of our um, company culture mm. to, to say that it's, it's good to delegate. It's good that somebody also can get, you know, uh, we would say that get the ball and run with it. Yeah, <laughs> because, sure. yeah. um, but at the same time, it's, it's really important that you don't do that all the time. Mm. And you don't have a top-down approach mm. to all decision making, mm. um, because it a it won't be the best decisions, and b it won't um, make people engaged. It won't yeah. get your baristas engaged in the daily work. Yeah. So to give them the opportunity to influence the aspects of their work will mean that you empower them more, and you you make. I think it, it's the biggest motivator that you can give people is, yeah. is to yeah to have them influence their own work. That's amazing. Um, moving on a bit from uh, from coffee shops, and I have a very good memory of you doing a presentation in Paris mm. uh, a few years ago. I believe it was a tamper tantrum yeah. event, if my memory serves me well. And uh, it was an amazing presentation, and it was focusing on the sustainability of farming and the direct trade approach that that you guys have here. Something that you guys are probably world renowned for uh let's jump into that a bit have a bit yeah. of discussions about that how did that come about how how or when did you guys start this approach as well in terms of direct trading the funny thing is actually it was it was literally how the company started um there were there were in my recollection there were two things that that casper and peter and i we sat down 
we're still working in another company and yeah. we had these talks about well how could we improve and the initial thoughts were basically just how could we improve that company and yeah. over time we realized that's probably not going to be possible we're not the owners we're not the decision makers mm. and it sort of translated suddenly into an idea like we need to do our own yeah. and there were there were really two things and one was to um, to have this holistic approach mm. and to do something where we'd actually integrate you know working with the farmers doing a roastery and a coffee shop together to sort of sort of think holistically about the whole seed to cup yeah. experience and you know to the consumer so that you wouldn't just be a roastery you know buying a raw product and selling you would actually try and take care of the brewing the whole process of mm. everything um, and the other thing was really based on the experiences we had in that other company who were actually doing um, a lot of direct trade-ish things. Yeah. They were dealing directly with some producers. They were for some coffees paying a better price. But we also saw that, you know, they weren't doing it with all their coffees. Yeah. We all we found that for the consumer to be confusing. When you're saying you're doing one thing, but then it's like two out of, of ten. Sure. You're doing we don't think that's fair. Yeah. We saw a lot of issues with fair trade that, you know, I still think fair trade should just be basically like a minimum wage. Yeah. It should be something that in my book, it should be something that you you just couldn't get away working with coffee if that wasn't the bare minimum yeah, that yeah, you did. Like yeah. that's the, it is because it is a bare minimum for yes. surviving producing coffee. Yeah. Um, and then we also saw the importance that you know even though that company had been buying directly from a farm for a number of years, they had seen quality go down. They yeah. it it culminated with a year where they couldn't even get coffee from that farm, even though another grocery were actually able to purchase from it and yeah. we realized well that's because they don't have a personal relationship with this yeah. farmer yeah. even though they're buying paying a, a better price they don't have a connection with them yeah and it's like if you think about it it's like i i kind of like to have a personal connection with everybody we're buying from even our you know our cup vendor mm. like i like that i know the guy and i know what they're about and they offer yeah. us a good service and so on and and so it's it translates into like if if you want to secure your your yeah your sort of your source of green coffee, I think that personal engagement goes a long way. Sure. Um, and we we basically we sat down. We had a bunch of ideas about well how how would we structure these things, and we sort of made some some guidelines for ourselves, and and, and it was all about the work that we would have to do. Mm. It was not about the work the farmer would have to do or mm. anybody else. It was like. How do we make some rules for ourselves so that it becomes better? That yeah. this broken coffee chain globally could hopefully improve, at yeah. least for the part that we are dealing with. Because we know we can't fix it, but we can fix what we are doing. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. And then the whole direct trade uh, concept actually came in because uh, back back at that time, there was a forum online where we were like about 100 and 150 international coffee people who are discussing a bunch of such things and Jeff Watts from Intelligentia put up a post about how they were working with direct trade yeah. and and we thought well wow there's a lot of similarities there mm. were also some things where we thought well that's not exactly how we want to do it but yeah. it's a lot of similarities and we started talking about it, it, there's something great about that sort of conceptualization of these ideas that makes it really easy to communicate mm. to an audience and we talked with Jeff about it and with, with Doc from Intelligentia as well. And they said that it's the, we asked them, how would you feel about us using this direct trade term? And they said, well, we know you guys. We love what you're doing. We trust you. Go with it. Yeah. And then they said, you should probably trademark it. Because yeah. what they were already back, and this is many years ago, they were already seeing it being misused in the States. And yeah. they actually had a trademark, but couldn't protect it, okay. basically. Which now... 10 years into us has the exact same thing has happened to us in okay. Denmark. Now we can't protect it anymore because there's big multinational companies who say, we're going to take you to court if you try to do this. Sure. And yeah. it's a fight you can't win. Yeah. But for us, the important part was never calling it direct trade. We just thought it, there's something really good about having a communication tool. Yeah. Because if you look at the interaction time you have with a, a customer in a coffee shop, when mm. they're looking at your retail shelf, for mm. example, that time is very short. Yeah. So to go into what you can go into on a podcast for an hour, or we can go into on a blog post that's 5,000 words or all these other things, that's a luxury you don't have in a coffee shop. Sure. 
But by having that direct trade indicating and something very easy to understand for a customer, it's something about the trade. Okay, I know from fair trade, okay, it's trade related. Mm. Direct, there's a direct link somehow. Then you had something to build on. You already had something where you could get an engagement with the consumer and talk more about what you're doing. Um, so we found it to work very well. Um, I don't know if we'll continue to use direct trade as, as a name okay. in the future. Um, I kind of hope that there would be something more, something where we could engage the industry more because yeah. I think we do need a, a better set of rules for ourselves, some guidelines. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny, I've, I've never met a roaster anywhere in the world who don't think they pay really well for coffee. Sure. Uh, everybody thinks, no, we yeah. pay really well for coffee, but we need a discussion about, well, what is paying really well for coffee? Because right now it's totally abstract. Yeah. And everybody, every export also tells their clients that, no, you, you pay really well for coffee. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I think but there's, there's not really a, a discussion about, well, what is, does that mean in nominal terms for each country, for each region, because that's also different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, I, I start to see some good uh, initiatives when Transparent Trade is doing a lot of work um, yeah. out of the uh, United States, and there's, an, uh, there's a meeting in Hamburg very soon uh, about it. But So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that there can be something where we can engage more, um, yeah. so we don't just constantly fall back and, and say, well, we do better than fair trade, because that's sure. like, it's not good enough. For sure, um, for sure. Yeah, but we'll, we'll see. It's, uh, I think it's interesting. For us, the, the core of it is that I think we have this very uh, dualistic um, mission or uh, say, um, our purpose, basically, in this, in this company. And it's, it's twofold. And one is that we really want to create exciting and exceptional coffee experiences yeah. and share them with as many people as possible. Mm. That basically means to do all the things that you know we as baristas know we do behind the scenes, but in a manner where it actually gets to people and it excites them about coffee and lifts it to a new level. And at the same time, we have this dualistic purpose where we also want to do better for farmers yeah. in the world. It's sure. it is incredible that we are we actually get to work with a product that are produced in some of the poorest countries in the world. Yeah, I think that's a huge opportunity for us. To actually get more value out there, sure. to get values in into these small villages in yeah. very rural parts of the world that really needs money, and if yeah. we can get value out there, yeah. that's a tremendous thing, and yeah. it can have a huge impact over time. Um, it can also feel completely, incredibly frustrating mm. because you you don't fix the problem easily. Yeah. You can work with this probably a lifetime and only see small improvements, but yeah. there are improvements and. You can see, we can see it from, from the money that we pour in, that they get to those people. Yeah. That has value. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, so I think it's, it's, that's, like, that, that's the purpose of our business. And it, I think both things excites us. Yeah. Uh, and it excites you know, people on the bar that they get to do these incredible drinks, but they also work for a purpose for someone else. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, you know, a bigger purpose to it than... Mm just making something delicious. Yeah. And at the same time, I think we're not able to make that the ultimate delicious cup if we don't do the other thing. Um, and especially if we look at it long term, I really think that these two things, it's like a mutually, uh, how to say, connected thing. Yeah. You know, if, if, we want to, if we want to bring more value to the farmers, we have to do really well on the brewing and serving side sure. and roasting. Yeah. Like we really have to up our game yeah. to get people to appreciate it, buy more, you know, then we can bring more money to the farmer. And if we bring more money to the farmer, we have to do that as well mm. to get better coffee so we can do those really yeah. great experiences yeah. the other way. We can get those amazingly uh, you know, exciting coffees the yeah. other way. So I see it as, as really interconnected and that's, you know, that's a fun thing. And yeah. What would you say, because the, the idea of direct trade is, is as you said as well, is, is pretty widely misunderstood. Yeah, uh, in, in a lot of ways. But let's say you are, uh, you know, let's say someone listened to this and they want to start a coffee roastery. Yeah. What are the kind of first three steps you should do if you want to start basically trading direct from the beginning? Because logistics wise, that's also a bit of hassle, right? It's a bit complicated based on volumes, right? Mm, it depends on how you look at it. Because th I think this is the thing I've met throughout all the years is that yeah. new roasteries say, ah, oh, we wish we could do direct trade. Sure. We're not big enough to do it yet. Yeah. Which is not really true because, yeah. I mean, we started out, we didn't have any funding. We put our own money into it. Yeah. We started in a 
what basically looked like a, a shipping container or something in, near the airport in a warehouse. And we yeah. put in a row ship, but the first two coffees we bought, we bought directly from farms. Okay. Um, and it is a matter of, I think the first thing is starting to understand how international logistics work. Yep, and sure. it's not, it seems like this crazy complicated thing, yep. which is not. Okay. It's, you know, you, you have to know a little, a few things about how containers are moved. You have to know how contracts are signed. But, you know, you can call any shipping company and they have really good people working there who do sure. this for a living. Yeah. And you can talk to them and ask them, well, I don't know what CAD means. Mm. And then they can explain it to you. Yeah. I don't know, how, how would I come about doing this and that? And mm. they can explain it to you and they can mm. help you with it. Mm. I mean, we were fortunate that Peter had already done this for a number of years before we started. So it was easy for us. So it's not to diminish the, the work that is. Yeah. But it is a matter of understanding that. And then, you know, I think... Back then, the challenge was basically getting contact with farmers. So we'd mm. go to the SEA trade show in the United States and we'd like look up, see who we could connect with online. Or mm. we'd also just go on a, on a plane and visit a country and then starting to meet with exporters and then see if those exporters were willing to let us work directly with a producer and, mm. and start cupping and maybe finding someone on the cupping table. Yeah. Other times we've had farmers approach us. Um, in the beginning, it was difficult. Like one of the last relationships we started up about four years ago happened via Instagram. Mm. A yeah, farmer sure. <laughs> contacted us through Instagram yep. and sent us a picture. And that's a farmer we've been dealing with for now for four years, like Minuri from Ethiopia. Yep. Um, so I think nowadays it's actually it's, it's far less complicated. There's more and more farmers starting to be online in some capacity or another where you sure. can connect. Yeah. Um, so I would say connect to farmers, get, a, get shipping logistics, yep. and then putting your money into green coffee because yeah. that's the that's the challenge sure taking that tough ass decision of saying well i'm gonna buy my all my liquidity mm. in green coffee and put it in a warehouse mm. i'm gonna roast and then sell it mm. over the coming year yeah. or whatever that's tough like the bank sure. thought we were nuts when hey, we started they, doing they, that and we had to explain to them well you know most other groceries they maybe they buy espresso machines and put up yeah. at their wholesale customers to yeah. try and lure them in that way yeah, and, yeah. and keep them sure. tied up we don't want to do that. Yeah. Like they can buy their machines. They should buy the machines. Yeah. It's their business. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then we said, well, well, we don't have a marketing budget. We'll try to just do things that are interesting and get people's right about it and then sure. spend our money that way. Um, so that's, I think those three things, putting your liquidity in greens, yeah. getting to know shipping yeah. and then, uh, and then connecting with farmers. That's, yeah. that's the key to, to doing it. Yeah. Amazing. And then maybe not call the direct trade, but just actually do it instead of I saying think it. So. I think it's, you know, uh, you, know it's, you go on any, any roastery website anywhere and you yeah. feel like transparency, uh, quality, and then some kind of direct trade, right? Yeah. Which we're, yeah. we're um, yeah. Uh, but for us, it's also, it's like, uh, I think over the years we realized that it, it's, it's actually less a marketing thing for us. Yeah. More a thing where we secure our supply chain. Sure. It's more a thing where we now, we have the, I find relatively unique position of all our coffees we've basically sourced ourselves. Yeah. Um, so that means that we have a menu that we don't share that menu with a lot of other people. We yeah, have true. a few uh, colleagues around that we also sometimes work with. Um, but that's more globally. We say, yeah. well, maybe if we get together, we can share all the coffee from this farmer in sure. Ethiopia. And yeah. then it's us, only us that has yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but also means that we over time can pour more efforts into the relationship going back and give more feedback mm. to the farmer on in terms of what are the quality issues we might see or what are the possibilities for a good development yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, for a large part, I think that development actually comes by itself once you start paying well for the coffee. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, it's good to push as well and be, you know, be helpful in any capacity you can. Sure, definitely. Let's uh, take the last few minutes and look a bit broader on things, right? Uh, let's look at, at the coffee at, in grand scale globally. Yeah. Like where, where are we heading? This is a very interesting discussion. Some people are, are only talking about fully automatic um, coffee brewers these days. No more barista staff. Mm. Um, but also like roasting-wise, coffee shop-wise, um, anything you want to talk about. Like where where do you think the future is heading? Where are we? Where are we now? And is where we are now a good place to be? Are we in a, in a, in a positive 
place as an industry? Um, yeah, that last one is a really good question, which, which is a tricky one. I think in the only thing I'm pretty certain about is that we'll see like we'll see the whole specialty coffee or third wave coffee shop, whatever we want to call it, movement sort of split in. It's going to fragment more, I think. Sure. Um, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of things that are exciting, but I think there's also maybe now more than ever a need for people to, to focus a little bit more on what, what are the, what's unique to them. What, are the, what is special to them? Like, mm instead of maybe trying to do everything and say, well, this is, this is what I want to do. Mm. Carve out your niche. Mm. I do think there's a, there's a lot of really interesting and exciting things going on. Um, I still think, I mean, globally, it's kind of, it's almost difficult to talk about because yeah. it's so different. Like you go to the States, it's one thing. Yeah. I mean, they've had the whole Starbucks revolution for so many years. Sure. It's almost like that revolution never really came in Denmark. Yeah. Like, and now there's this weird middle revolution where you know Espresso House is expanding like crazy. They yeah. bought Barreso, which was yeah. like the local little Danish Starbucks sort of, and now they're expanding. But you know they've also improved tremendously. I think oh, over, over the years, and and you're seeing a lot more smaller independent groceries and coffee shops opening. So, I think everything is is really exciting. But then you look globally and you see you know. Places like Blue Bottle going in one direction. That's sort of like, in like a an, an in between of of uh, what we'd usually say. There was like all the independence and then chains, and now there's this suddenly this in betweener yeah, sure. that fills out a big void, yeah. and that's super interesting. But that only also so far is happening in some countries. Yeah. You go to Asia. This like it's a whole nother ball game. So sure. it's it's really difficult for me to talk about like one global trend i think there's a multitude of, of trends happening in yeah. different regions um in denmark i think we, we've been in a lot of ways we've been behind for a long time on the other hand i feel like we're in front on other areas i think yeah. the last uh, five years in coping has been really exciting with you know lots of new places opening this finally it's like there's more and more stuff happening and it's not like i feel we're anywhere near um saturation of the market yet sure um at all um yeah. and i think copenhagen i think we're we've we're, we're kind of blessed with an environment where we dare to do different shops like not just us but also like our good colleagues at prologue and democratic anderson and Mayard, mm. your company for example as a roastery not a mm. coffee shop but as a roastery and um and now i'm absolutely forgetting someone yeah. <laughs> but you know but but you know people are doing their own things which is great so i think there's like a lot of uh, forlorn should mention yeah. uh there's a lot of good places that you can visit for their own thing yeah, and yeah, they're sure. you know they're exciting to visit where yeah. i mean sometimes i go to to big cities and like i don't want to shame anyone <laughs> i was recently on a trip and i asked like a bunch of people where's exciting where should i yeah, go yeah. and i didn't get an answer nobody yeah. could say oh that coffee shop is super exciting yeah. you should definitely go check out their whatever on the menu yeah which is like come on like i know i'm not the you know just your average customer but at least there should be someone who caters to me someone definitely, who caters to the person who wants to go find out like that special thing that yeah. excites someone you yeah. know um I did find it, fortunately, eventually, but it, it took, like, I, I would have expected more, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah um, sure, sure. And that's what I think is exciting in Copenhagen right now when we have people visiting. It's like, I can name six or seven places that, oh, you should go there and you should yeah. try that thing. You should go there and try that thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that, for me, is where it gets exciting. But at the same time, it's also, we, we have to be careful in our industry. We have, a, we have a tendency to quite often focus on ourselves. We are not our Definitely. own, like, biggest customers. Sure. Um, at the same time, I feel we can't lose that either yeah. because that is part of what people are buying into that, yeah. you know, experience of what excites these guys. And I do the same. If I yeah. go to a wine bar or a beer bar or, you know, a cocktail place or whatever, I kind of go to the places that I know they're excited about it. They yeah. want to do something. They have new things that excites them because most likely I'm going to get something that's really exciting then as well. Sure. Um, yeah. Because there's plenty of beer bars around that just serves a tap beer. But yeah. 
I don't go to them. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. I know you want excitement and a bit of passion, and that's something that that's part of why we all ended up in coffee as well, right? And, yeah. and I definitely agree with the fact that in in a lot of cities you go to around the world, you just don't get that to the level that you want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to see. But it's why. gotten better. Like at least like sure. by now, you can almost like there's not a single big city in the world I feel that doesn't have like a specialty coffee shop with someone who's passionate like this. At least there's, that has changed tremendously. You know, um, it used to be that major European cities like you couldn't even name one coffee place, yeah. and now most places have three or four. Sure, um, which is exciting. That's a, a huge development. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is the um, what is the future of Cup Collective? I know you guys just opened a shop, yeah. so that's probably not what you're thinking about right now. But yeah. where do you where do you want it to go? You're obviously more than more than you behind Cup Collective, yeah. but uh, like from your own perspective as well, where where do you want this to to end up? Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because we've never had like those kind of like this is the plan for in twenty years this yeah. is where we're gonna be or you know these big plans. Um, I think in for the first many years, I think we were almost afraid of talking about growth. You know. Yeah. It's like it, it had this negative ring for us of being capitalistic if you talk about growth. But it's also because most people talk about growth. It's like that's the only thing that matters to them. Sure. And over time, I think we realized that that like our desire for growth is not from you know, making more money or yeah. you know, having a higher turnover or just being everywhere yeah. or being more uh, well-known or anything. Our desire for growth very much comes from two things. And one is that from this experience of you know going for example to Kenya the first year we went there I think we bought 20 bags and the yeah. next year we bought 40 bags and it's like we paid a really high price and remember like people say oh that's like some of the highest price being paid and it's mm. like oh great and we were like yeah. celebrating for ourselves but it's like yeah but it's 20 bags yeah it's not gonna, it's not gonna mean that much it. it's like a fraction and now we buy a, a full container and we're yeah. paying even more than we did back then yeah. so now like seeing that effect that that has suddenly makes it like that's fantastic. Yeah. And we've always had this thing, like we didn't want to to uh, take in too many coffees, like too many different coffees. We yeah. would rather grow volume on each of the farmers that we're working with so we can have a bigger impact with them yeah. sure. and make it more meaningful for them yeah. before we took on new, new origins, new countries. Um, but then we see like if we, can, if we can get to do that and we can get to grow the amount that we buy from the farmers, that's fantastic. So yeah. that's a huge motivation for us in terms of growing is yeah. that we're able to do that have a bigger impact and and also potentially being able to buy coffee from more origins yeah of course because yeah. that's fun and it <laughs> excites us mm. uh, and the other thing is is um, is basically for i would say for the staff or for ourselves as well to see it grow and be able to provide those opportunities for growth as, as you mentioned before for staff members to to start to engage with other areas of coffee yeah um, Peter Eprop, who, who I mentioned earlier, who has been a bar manager with us for many years, I think he's worked for us for like six years or something now. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, he approached and said he'd really like more challenges and more to get to that sort of next level of yeah. uh, sourcing coffee as well and taking part of that. And the way we've, we've always done it, I think we all had that initially, that approach that we kind of wanted that as well. Mm. And we've divided the countries between us so that yeah. each of us can focus on some countries. And it was very apparent at that time that we needed someone to focus more on Colombia. Sure. So he has, he's gotten Colombia as his country. He goes there once or twice a year. Yeah. He uh, he's, uh, practices Spanish so he can speak with him to, yeah. to language courses and really lifted him to the next level in terms of that appreciation. And it's great because now the farmers down there know him. He can speak more fluently with him, keep yeah. in touch with him throughout the year and so on. Um, and that's something we couldn't have done if we had decided to go the other route, which I think is also super... Uh, I, I really have a, a admiration for people who do that. Sort of the, I usually refer to it as sort of the Japanese artisanal approach where yeah. you say, no, I'm just going to have this one business and I'm going to do this for 40 years. Sure. I have huge admiration admiration yeah. for that um, but at the same time that is that is very limiting it, it means that you like then you're only doing it for yourself and mm. there's not a lot of potential for growth for other people mm. Mm. so I think for us that's the other big part of our motivation for, for growing the business 
and where we're going to be even in a year. I really don't know. It, like uh, two months ago, I would have sworn we wouldn't open another coffee shop yeah. like in the next year. Like really. <laughs> and then this opportunity presented itself and I was like, ah, this is too fun to pass on. And it's, you know, let's, let's try it out. And um, so I don't know. I really don't know. There's, there's, there's definitely going to happen something, but what exactly it is, I... I, I, it's not, and it's not like I don't want to tell it <laughs> but I, I, just, no, I no, don't know time, time it's will like show. time will show yeah definitely but I think it's exciting it would take one shot at a time I'm sure we're going to open something else eventually um, yeah but yeah we'll see amazing I think that's a, that's a great note to wrap up on as well yeah. uh, thank you very much for your time hey, it's thanks been really it's been fun. a pleasure cool. to, to talk to you yeah, yeah of course <laughs>